Good morning. Today is Thursday, the 25th of June, and I'm delighted to be with you today for morning prayer on this rainy day here in Sumter, South Carolina, but nonetheless a beautiful day because we know above the rain is the sun still shining. And of course, in the cl clouds and storms of our life, Jesus Christ is still present. God still loves us. The Holy Spirit is with us. Well, let us begin our worship this morning with the opening sentence, which is from Psalm 43, verse 3. Oh, send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace, there is no help in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults, Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises, declared to all people in Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The Venite. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth, and the heights of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship, and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. The Psalms appointed for today are Psalm 132 and 133. Lord, remember David and all his tribulations, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed a vow unto the Almighty God of Jacob. I will not come within the tabernacle of my house, nor climb up into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep, nor my eyelids to slumber neither the temples of my head to take any rest until I find a place for the temple of the Lord. Habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we have heard the ark is in Ephrathah and founded in the wood. We will go into his tabernacle and fall low on our knees before his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place you and the ark of your strength. Let the priest be clothed with righteousness and let your saints sing with joy. For your servant David's sake, turn not away the presence of your anointed. The Lord has made a faithful oath unto David and he shall not shrink from it. Of the fruit of your body shall I set upon your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, 
Their children also shall sit upon the throne, thy throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion for himself. He has longed for her to be his habitation. This shall be my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have a delight therein. I will bless her provisions and with increase, and I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall rejoice and sing. There shall I make the horn of David flourish. I have prepared a lantern for my anointed. As for his enemies, I shall clothe them with shame, but upon his head shall his crown flourish. Psalm 133. Behold, how good and joyful a thing it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the edges of his clothing, like the dew of Hermon, which falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord promised his blessing, even life forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our lesson today is a continuation of St. Paul's letter uh, to the church in Thessalonica, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Finally then, brothers and sisters, uh, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions I, we gave you through uh, the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no transgression and wrong uh, no one transgress and wrong his brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you're doing uh, to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle is the Gloria in Excelsis. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Fill us with your presence. Dwell within us. Remind us of that truth that because the Spirit dwells within us, because Jesus promises to be with us, 
Our body is a temple. Amen. Today, we have the potential to weave in several themes from the various readings that we had. Uh, looking first and reflecting first on the Psalter, um, Psalm 132 and 133, uh, David has looked out from his palace, if you will, and he, he sees no temple, no palace built for God. You remember that God's original dwelling place with Moses was in a tent. And when they arrived in the promised land, they simply pitched the tent. David wanted to build a temple glorious to the glorious God. But because of his sin with uh, Bathsheba, the murder of her husband, the adultery that he forced upon her, um, God said, no, I'm not going to allow you to build the temple, uh, but your son Solomon will. And he did. Here, the temple is not even, excuse me, it appears here that the Ark of the Covenant has been captured at some point, has been kidnapped, if you will, and so they've heard that it's now in this place called Eratha. It's been found in the wood. And so there's a desire here not only to build God's temple, but to recover it first, recover the Ark of the Covenant, to recover uh, the, the precious, um, more than symbols, but the, the dwelling place that God chose um, to dwell. And, and so it says, we will go into his tabernacle and we will fall low on our knees before his footstool. Now it's important, they weren't worshiping the items, that would be idolatry, they were worshiping God. And these items are where God chose to dwell. So that's Psalm 132, where um, David is desirous of, of building and recovering to build. Uh, Psalm 133 is talking about the beauty, the joy of brethren, brothers and sisters who live together in unity. That's an important theme that's also picked up today in our lesson from St. Paul uh, to the Thessalonians. He first of all challenges them, and, and you hear this more and more repeated twice. He first of all in challenges the Thessalonians and us uh, to live with sexual purity, not impurity. Uh, the instruction that we're given, if you will, is for our sanctification. We're justified, that is, made righteous before God by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He dying on the cross for your sins and my sins. We're justified, made righteous, to be worthy to be called sisters and brothers and sons and daughters and princes and princesses of God, the King, in his, in his kingdom. But there is this problem of sexual immorality uh, that goes back uh, as long as man has been there. And of course, we have the first murder. That, that's not sexual in its nature. But you see, if you murder somebody, all else kind of follows, follows right in, uh, right along with that. And of course, that's Cain and Abel. Well, sexual sins have been with us since Adam and Eve's fall. And sexual immoral immorality is not just at equal to any other sin. And I'm not saying that I'm on authority, but St. Paul uh, writes, uh, writes in his first letter to the Corinthians, the church in Corinth, and he talks about because uh, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and when we commit sexual sins, we sin against God. We sin against the person that, that, that we have cooperated with in sin or forced ourselves, and we sin against our own body. And, and so St. Paul writes in the church to Corinth that, you know, most of our sins are outside sins. We've done something. We've stolen something. We've lied. Uh, they, they don't, they're not an outward, they're not an inward self-destruction. But sexual sins also provide inward desecration of our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. And, and so sexual sins, there, there's no wonder that we are preoccupied 
with sinner, as sinners with sexual sins, and there's no surprise that the scripture has to address those with maybe a higher degree as uncomfortable as that makes us. And one of the challenges we know is that sexual immorality leads to so many other things because we're all tempted. We've all succumbed, I suspect, on one level or another. And remember Jesus using hyperbole, exaggeration. If you've been angry with someone, you've murdered them. If you've lusted for someone, you've had sexual relations with them. He, he, he really shows our need for him as our savior and our inability to to be the righteous uh, sanctified person on our own which is why we have daily confession but here we're supposed to practice control over our bodies and live in a life a witness of holiness and honor not driven by passions like the animals one of the things is you sometimes hear is well you know survival of the fittest and you know we're just doing what the animal kingdom does yes that's called sin that's the sad thing humans are called to live above the animal kingdom we're given dominion we have higher expectations because God gave us a mind a will a soul a body for his glory and, and for our sanctification. So God has not called us to impurity, but to holiness, as St. Paul writes in verse, in verse 7. And then he gives a stern warning. <laughs> you, you're not disregarding my words, St. Paul, if you don't listen to this. You're disregarding God, who gives the Holy Spirit to live within you. It's, it's a stern warning, a call for purity. And, and the other thing before I move on, is because we have all on one level or another fallen into that temptation of sexual sins it is so easy for the devil to just slightly nudge us to start start justifying it because of course no one wants to feel guilty uh, wants to feel judged uh, wants to go oh i you know oh i messed up again so we start excusing it and when you excuse one sin you will soon excuse the whole lot of them and then we'll be well in the trouble we find ourselves today but it's not unique to today this has been a struggle of humanity since day one if you look at the early roman empire the roman empire of which the time paul is writing they are sexually promiscuous uh, as much so as we are today now we with technology have managed to uh, take uh, pornography and so forth to new super levels uh, but that sin has always been with us. And so Paul and Jesus and, and the church know darn well what they're talking about uh, when they're talking about sexual sins. Uh, there's nothing new there under the sun. Well, Paul is talking about sexual immorality and calling us all to repentance and to holiness through the power of the Holy Spirit. The next point, that, and, he, and he remember he says, he uses those words, you know, do this, you know, live this life, brothers, sisters, as you ought to walk and please God, as you're doing, but do so more and more. And more and more he repeats now, starting with verse 9, because he's talking now like brotherly love, sisterly love. It's where we get the word Philadelphia from, brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. And it says, you know, you know this rule, you know what we're supposed to do, God taught it to you himself to love one another. That's the summary of the law and the prophets. You know this just as well. We are to love God completely and totally and to love our neighbor as ourselves. I, I quoted this today in an earlier Facebook post because in South Carolina, our infection rate for COVID-19 is skyrocketing. It's affecting younger people now because they're more risky in behavior. And of course, that's not just gonna dwell within younger folks. They're gonna to come to their parents, they're gonna see their grandparents, and they're going to make people sick. Not only themselves, teenagers have died and are dying. It's not just an old person's disease, it's just older people are more susceptible. But the reality is, if we love other people more than we love ourselves, which I believe is what Jesus is teaching us to do, self-sacrificial love, and if we want people to treat us with care and concern, 
then we should do the same for them. And so we're asked to social distance, wear our masks, wash our hands regularly, to protect others, to basically say, I love you by doing this. It is not a political statement. It's a statement of love, of care, of saying, I'll be inconvenienced for your safety. And of course, there's a side benefit for my safety too, for your safety and my safety. Well, brotherly love is what God has taught, particularly the Thessalonians, Thessalonians and us. Uh, to love one another. And so he says, do that, but I urge you to do it more and more. And then he gives us some specifics. And I want to review those. To aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as you've been instructed. Apparently, even though there's a lot of good things going on in the church in Thessalonica, apparently there were some divisions here. Some people had kind of gotten lazy and they were very content for other people to take care of them. Remember the church shared all things in common. There's some people, and I'm not saying we're not doing it now, so of course it's not directed at anybody in any particular situation. We tell people when we have a potluck, some people don't know about it. Some people can't afford it. And we want it to be open to everybody without any qualifications. So we say, come, you don't have to bring anything, enjoy. But there's some people who know about it, who can't afford it, and they're just takers. They take because it's offered and they don't give. Now, I hope you're making the distinction I'm trying to make, you're connecting the dots. I'm not talking about people who can't afford. I'm not talking about people who don't know about it. We want them to be fully equal. God shows no partiality. The church should, know, should show no partiality between rich and poor, black and white, any of, you know, any of that, the races, whatever, economics, education. It's a level playing field. But when you've been given gifts by God and you're only a taker and not a giver, I would simply challenge, where's the thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is often giving back in thanks. And so um, he's writing to the church here, to the Thessalonians, and saying, you know, some of you guys uh, need to work with your hands and stop being takers. But there are apparently some other people who are interfering. <laughs> uh, they like to stir the pot. They like to get into other people's business. And he's saying to them, live your life quietly, mind your own affairs, stay in your side of the lane. Jesus teaches of this, of course, you know, the, the speck in someone's eye and we have a plank in our own. What he doesn't say is, will you just be blind and you just be blind? He says, first of all, take the plank out of your eye and then you can help your brother with the speck. He doesn't say, just leave everybody alone. Well, we need to be careful. One of the things I've seen lately with the issue of racism and abuse of power is I've seen people of, of intelligence who don't want to talk about the issue so they divert the issue to something else or will hide behind gossip by posting something and, 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 and it's gossip. There's no verification, there's been no attempt and, and you know there's actually within the church an understanding it's called the sin of calumny. You can look it up, calumny. The sin of calumny is saying something bad about another person, even if it's true, for the sake of spreading, did you know about so-and-so? There's no good that comes from it, you see. It's, it's, it's a form of gossip that's actually true gossip. And that's called a sin of calumny. Uh, St. Paul is saying, if you're lazy, don't be. Contribute, add to the body. Don't, don't just be a taker. And he's also saying, Aspire to live quietly and stay in your own lane. Mind your affairs and, and then you'll be helping others mind their affairs by everybody doing what they're supposed to do. The parts of the body doing their, their call role. And he, he says, you know, you're doing both of these things, do it more and more. And so I just simply end by encouraging you, who I'm sure are doing some of these things too. I mean, we're not, 
we're all striving. We've all been given the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're headed in the right direction, I believe. I trust, I pray. It's just a call to do more and more. And remember, we can't do that on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. So we pray, come, Holy Spirit, come, and enable us to be the people of God that Jesus died for and called us to be. Amen? Well, let's continue with the Apostles' Creed now. I'm going to take a sip of tea, and we'll continue. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Before I get into the uh, this, the Lord have mercy, Kyrie, uh, one thing to just sort of note, it is a, it has a penitential not notion to it. The Lord have mercy upon us. Christ have mercy upon us. It has a penitential notion. But also within the, this is actually something that Romans tended to say to their emperor as he passed by in some type of parade or procession, it was basically look favorably upon us. It wasn't always, you see, penitential. Sometimes it was a request for help. And so as we say the Kyrie here together, uh, remember that it's it has a penitential component. We know that we're unworthy. We know that we need the help of Christ. We need the help of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it is also a, a request for a blessing. The closest analogy I can come up with uh, is children at the Christmas parade when they're, you know, they're yelling to Santa Claus at the end, throw us some candy. Lord have mercy upon us. Christ have mercy upon us. Send us a blessing. And so I, I want you to appreciate the dual role of the Kyrie. I'm sorry. Have mercy. Um, have mercy. Send me a blessing. It's a dual nature to the Kyrie. I've been meaning to share that with you for a while. Well, let's continue now with the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. The colic for today, which is from this past Sunday, which is found under proper seven in the Book of Common Prayer. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, Nourish us with all goodness and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The colic signed for Thursdays is a colic for guidance. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the first collect or prayer for mission, your mission and mine, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in Sumter, in Florida, in Virginia and Maryland, across the world, wherever you are. Almighty and everlasting God, you alone works, who alone works great marvels, send down upon our clergy and the congregations committed to their charge the life-giving spirit of your grace. Shower them with the continual dew of your blessing and ignite in them a zealous love of your gospel through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite your prayers, intercessions, petitions, thanksgivings, that you may simply lift up to the Lord right now, post on our parish website on the prayer request and praise report page, or record uh, in the live Facebook feed uh, as, you're, as you're watching it. Take this time now to offer our prayers. Lord Jesus, help us to love as you have loved us and love us. Help us to love God and love all people, regardless of anything else. Let the devil not put any adjectives in front. Let us love all people with the charity, grace, and love that you give us. May we pass it on to every person that we meet, that we know, that we write to, that we communicate with, that we see. You have loved us. Let us pass that love self-sacrificially without expectation of return. And let us be a blessing as you have blessed us. Amen. Please join me in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, you, uh, excuse me, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Please join with me in the prayer to, of St. John Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you, and you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, that you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, uh, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. 
I noted as I closed my eyes to pray when I opened them, the sun had come out. That is not me, <laughs> but it does remind me that sometimes the, the clouds cover our eyes and with God's grace they can be opened and we can see the sun shining down. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, have a blessed day and God willing, tomorrow being Friday, we'll see you then. Be a blessing as you are blessed. Bye.